Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vassell, and today we're taking eight a look at eight games here, some fast reviews of these games. Most of them pretty small, but one of these games is the worst game I've played this year. Crazy. Well, let's get started. Here we go. Naturopolis, a wallet size game. I don't have a, wall, a pocket to put this in. This is the sequel to Sprawopolis and Agropolis. Um, it is a, eh, you could play with multiple players, but this is essentially a solo game uh, in which you're going to put out some cards. You're going to uh, well, you know, I'll just show you. Naturopolis uses a deck of 18 cards. These cards are going to have different terrain types on them. So you can see the different terrain types. And there's also roads and rivers. And finally, each one has somewhere on it a campsite. So you can see they have all four terrain types. They're just going to be in different spots. You're going to start with one. And as the game goes by, you're going to add more. You can put them on top. You can you can just attach them together, but you can't put a road connected to a river. But I could put that one there. And I could put this one here if I want to. I could put that one there. As long as I don't have a road running into a river, I am forming basically my play area. So you're always going to have three cards to pick from when you're playing this game. Now, at the beginning of the game, you're going to be building a 15 of your 18 cards because three of your cards you're going to turn over and these three cards are going to be your scoring cards. Now there's a couple things. First of all, these three numbers are added together. That's your total score that you're trying to get. I need 22 points. You're going to have a base score. You're going to pick your largest group of each type. So this is not a very good setup, but my largest forest is two. My largest mountains is three. My largest pink is one. My largest water is one. So I'd add those together. Then you subtract two points for each road because this is Naturopolis. We don't want any many roads in there. And then you'll score for each of these. So for example, this one scores one point for each lake group that's connected to at least one road or river. But I lose two for each lake group that's not connected to road or river. So this one's not connected. This one is connected. This one's not connected. That one's not connected. So I'm losing six points and only getting one. So this one's losing me five points. This one gives me three points for a straight river section directly between two adjacent lake blocks. And all of these are going to have different things. Some of them have to do with rivers. A lot of them have to do with rivers, actually. Some of them have to do with campsites. This one here is having groups of mountains. And you're going to have a different combination of three each time. And then you'll be using the other ones to build your area. If you're playing with multiple players, you have three, you'll pass to the next person, they'll draw one but that's how you play the game. So I struggled with the rating for this game because I like it a lot. I like Sprawlopolis. I think Sprawlopolis is fun. I liked Agripopolis. I gave both of them 8.5, but I'm only giving this one an eight. And I'll tell you why, because, well, it's the same thing. I don't know. I mean, I can't keep getting that excited about these. This one's slightly different that roads are minus two points instead of one like the base game. And obviously there's different ways to score in them. I thought I felt like the ways to score in this feels like it's slightly a little more convoluted but it's still fun and I almost exclusively play this solo playing it with more multiple people you're basically just playing a cooperative solo game but I like the idea it's small it's portable looks fine it's yeah the, the worst thing I can say about it is I don't I don't need to own this like I own Sparopolis and when you had a Grig a Grigopolis sorry you can mix those together and I think you can mix this with them too but really, how many of the same game do you need? And at a certain point, why? Maybe you just maybe you've run the other one into the ground, I suppose. But if you've never played Sparopolis or Agropolis before, then you should get this. It's a great game. Or Sparopolis. I like the city theme a little bit better than the nature theme, at least when I'm building cards out there. But either way, still a fun little game. Trio has been getting all sorts of buzz. Uh, it was a game that at the Essen Spiel Fair this year, people were moving to get quickly. Who will be the smartest to figure out which numbers are hidden under the cards? Let's take a look. In this game, players are playing with a deck that has cards that are numbered from 1 to 12. You're going to shuffle them. Everyone's going to get a certain number of cards. And there's going to be a certain number of cards that are placed in the middle of the table. The cards that you have in your hand, you need to put them in your numerical order from smallest to largest. So here I have 2, 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, 9. Your goal of this game is to get triplets. 
you either want to get the three sevens, you'll win with that, or any three triplets. Or if you're playing the spicy way, if you get the triplet of nine, you want to get the matching ones here too. So eights with one, fours with threes or eleven. So you get two triplets, you win. How do you do that? Well, on your turn, you're basically playing memory. You can turn over a card in the middle if you want to, and you can turn over another card, and they have to be the same number. But if you fail, you turn them back. You don't turn over a card in the middle. You can ask someone for their highest or lowest card. Nothing else. You can't ask them for one in the middle. So I might be like, John, show me your highest card. And if John's highest card happens to be a 10, great. He puts it in front of him. I turn over this one, and then maybe I, in my hand, for my highest card, I ask myself if I have the highest card, have the other 10. If that's the case, then I get to keep all three. Otherwise, we turn them all over and it's the next person's turn. And that's it. You just keep going around till someone wins. Huh. I gotta be honest, folks. I was very surprised at the love for Trio. Now, I don't think it's a terrible game. I wanna say it up front, I'm giving it a six. It's fine. But I don't know what people see about it. It's just memory match. It's just that some of the cards are in other people's hands. So you're trying to guess where the cards are, right? Oh, well, I, the highest card I have is a six. So I know the seven through 12 cards are in other people's hands or whatever. And, and, and I like that winning the sevens wins you the game because that's in the middle. The number part of it works for me. It's just that you're basically saying, okay, you flipped over a seven. You turned it face back down. I know that's where a seven is. You flipped over a nine. That's where a nine is. You asked Bob if his lowest number is a two. That's where the two is. But then... You play two twos from your own hand, and you take Bob's two, and I'm like, okay, well, now I don't know any more information. Again, people seem to like it. I just, I'm like, uh, that's it. It's okay. It's okay. Wait for me to pass some time, but that's about it for me with Trio. Uh, the other Dice Tower people all like it more than me. Sixto cracks me up because in the in rule books they go, Sixto is a typical roll and write game. <laughs> Come on. Yes, it is, but don't say that. Um... It is a fast rolling dice. Oh, you know, I'm just going to show you because this cover looks the same as all these other games. Each player is going to get a sheet in this game. One person is going to be given the six dice. They're going to roll them. They can decide to keep them or they can re-roll them. But if you re-roll them, you have to roll all of them. Then each player can decide to use some, all, or none of the dice. So let's say, for example, I want to use, uh, let's look at each of the dice in order. A purple one. Well, the first number here is five, after that is one. So you know what, I'm gonna skip five, I can never go back, and I'm gonna cross off one. Then I have the blue three. I don't wanna cross off four numbers before I do the three, so I'm gonna skip that one. Green six, three numbers before six, I don't like that either. Three numbers before four, ooh, a one in the first column, I'll take that. And a two in the second column, I'll skip the six and take a two. So that's how the game's gonna work. Then the next person rolls the dice and I go from there. So for example, now I have the six. I'm like, oh, I'll skip the four and do the six. You don't have to skip numbers like I'm doing. You can if you want to. Now, there's these three numbers here at the end. You can only cross off those three numbers if you've crossed off four numbers earlier. So you need to have four boxes in this row before you can cross off these three. When somebody here crosses off the second number in that group of three, then that color is canceled for everybody else. That color die is no longer rolled. And when the third die is removed, when we're down to only three dice, that ends the game. At that point, you're going to count the number of X's that you have in each row and column total. If you have zero, you get zero points. If you have only one, you're going to lose five points. Two gives you no points, but after that, you start getting points. Five, ten... And if you get 11 in the same row, you get 66 points. Whoever has the most points is the winner. You would think it fitting that I give Sixto a six rating, but I'm giving it a seven because Sixto is pretty fun. Here's where Sixto works really well for me. It works well in the mass market in the sense of this is the kind of game that should be sold next to Uno. I play as a people, it's really easy to explain. You roll the dice and then you can re-roll all of them. That's it. You move that in a line, you cross off all the numbers except for the one you know, you, you skip numbers and then you cross off one. That's it. You, you can use some of the dice or all the dice. So easy, so quick, and it works. Everyone understands it. It's one of the most basic roll and rights I've ever played. And yet, in this case, I would say that's a good thing. So a nice game, a good game to give out as a gift, a nice introductory game, six though. Silver and Gold Pyramids. This is a game I didn't even know existed because I played the game Silver and Gold. It's a great little 
roll and write game or flip and write game in this sense where you're flipping over cards and then uh, crossing off islands for buried treasure. Here you're now going into the pyramids, into the tunnels of doom. Oh, what a great video game. And finding treasure. Let me show you. In this game, you're using a deck of pyramid cards. Everyone's going to get two. You'll get four and keep two of them. Then it'll be a display of four here. You're going to go through several rounds. Players are going to be keeping track on the scorecard as you go through the four rounds. And in those four rounds, you're going to go through these eight cards. Well, actually, you're only going to go through seven. So one card won't be used each round. So a card will be turned over. So here we have an L. And I can flip the L, rotate the L, but I'm drawing an L, or I'm crossing off X's in the shape of an L, going into one of my uh, pyramids. So I could put the L, for example, I could put the L, let's see, I want it to come in here. Now that seems bad because I did a, I did a skull, so I'm going to have to cross off a skull here, and the more skulls I have crossed off at the end of the game, I could lose 55 points. So that seems like a bad idea. Although there are cards that have potions on them, and if you cross off a potion, then you'll be able to delete two of your skulls. This one here, let's say I had done it like this, gives you an X, and you can put an X anywhere, although all shapes have to be next to something you already have, so I might do a torch. Why would I want to do a torch? Well, once per round, you can circle the torch. If you get this torch circled, you get five points per round. Other things give you the green and the red gems, which are worth one point, but for every pair, you get five points. And when you get to the end here, so let's say I'm, I'm trying to get to the end here. I get a box, like one, two, three, four. I put it next to my L I did. I got another skull from doing that. Ooh, three, and I just realized I'm gonna have a hard time filling this in. Well, the good news, anytime I take a shape, I can just do a single X. And if I get the second one there, um, I, and there's also a two shape, I could have just waited for that. But once you cover up that box, the dungeon's over. You'll put it in front of yourself and you'll pick a new one up here. If multiple people do it on the same turn, these numbers will determine which one you take. When you finish your second, fourth, or sixth pyramid of a color, you get points. So if I do my second green, I get 10 points and everyone else will cross that 10 off. Maybe later on, Bob gets two greens, so he does six, so I can't get that one. But if I get my fourth green, I might get three points. After four rounds, you're going to add up the points for all this stuff together, and whoever has the most points is the winner. This is kind of a sideways step from silver and gold. If you like silver and gold, you'll probably like this. There's a lot of differences, but they play almost identically in a sense, and I like them about equally. I'll give this one an eight out of ten. I like it very much. Yeah, you flip over the card, you pick one of your two dungeons to go through, you connect the different shapes, flipping them, moving them around. You can stay in the dungeon longer and try to get more of the red and green gems while trying to avoid the skulls. Or you can finish a dungeon quick to get those points. I thought the points for the getting sets of green and pyramids and stuff like that, I thought there was a little, I don't know, it, felt, it feels a slight clunkiness there, just the slightest bit. But the rest of it's smooth, easy, and is a little thematic for a roll and write game. I think a lot of people enjoy it. It's easy to sit up and play and get started right away. And you don't have to erase any, I mean, you everything's laminated already, so you can just jump right in. So silver and gold pyramids. Color Square is another roll and write game where you roll colored dice and write down the numbers in the four color corners, trying to get to a target number in the middle. Let me show you. In this game, players are trying to get the most points. When it's your turn, you will roll all these dice like this. You are gonna pick two of the colored dice. Everyone else is gonna use the white dice. So maybe, for example, I'll take this yellow one. I'm gonna write it here. I have to write it in a yellow spot. And then maybe I'll take the five of blue and I'll write it here. Now, why am I writing these numbers in a spot? Because I want all of these, when I finish them, to equal the number there. If I do so, I'm gonna circle that number. I'm gonna get points and everyone else on their sheets, let's say someone else got 14, they will cross it off. If though, for example, you fill in a number and it's only 11, it's not 16, then I have to do this and I'm gonna lose 10 points for that at the end of the game. Now, what I'm hoping for, sometimes I might have like a two, one, three, well, there's no way that can make 18. I'm hoping someone else gets 18 so I can cross it off and I won't lose points. That's pretty much it. So you pick two color dice when it's your turn, when it's someone else's turn, you use the white die and you can put that die anywhere you want. When everything is finished, you're just going to add together all your points for the ones you circled. You'll notice there's little bonus numbers on some of these. And you also, if you get two next to each other and there's a little hexagon between them, 
you will score five points for getting ones that are next to each other. There's a way to play with advanced way where on the other side, there's some kind of like there, there's always a two, a two has to be put there, but this can be a six through 10. That could be a 14 through 18. So a few changes. And you also can throw away a few dice down here. Uh, during the course of the game. This roll right, is, I think, is actively bad. I'm giving it a 5 out of 10. I do not like this. It's There's a couple reasons I don't like it. One is because you feel so limited. You know, if you write a 1, if you're trying to get that 4 that you saw me get. So I write a 1, 1, 1. Now I need a yellow 1. I'm waiting and waiting. Yes, I can wait till someone else rolls a white 1. But at some point, you're going to be forced to take numbers in different spots based on what's rolled. And you're going to have negative points. The game just feels like a you're pushing the rock up the hill forever. So you're about to finish one. Someone else finishes it first. You can't finish this one. You finish some. And then you get points for finishing them next to each other because you got lucky. Not because you really tried to or anything. This game feels super random and lucky. And I just really don't like it. The game gets less fun as time goes by and until the end. The reverse side of the sheet is slightly more interesting, but not enough for me to recommend the game. Color Square, I don't like it. Gnar. This game got a lot of buzz this year from Bombix Games. This is in this, in the kind of, from Thomas DuPont, this is sort of in the Citadels category or card game category, a Viking-themed game. Let me show you. In this game, each player has a ship, and that ship can hold recruits, and these uh, golden bracelets, so you know up to three of those. You're going to have a crew, so you have a couple cards, and you'll also have a hand of cards. And then some cards are placed out here, some destination cards. On a player's turn, the very first thing they will do is they will look at this track. So at the beginning of the game, this track is zero. It's your reputation track. But as you move your piece on it, once you pass the one or the two or the three, you will get that many points per turn. And that's important because getting 40 points will end the game. What you're going to do then is you're either going to recruit or explore. Recruiting is pretty easy. You simply will play a card from your hand. When you play a card from your hand, you'll put it in the matching column of that color. So you can have the five columns. And then you get all the stuff on the top of these. So this one here gives me a recruit. And it moves me up one victory point. So I get both of those things. And then I played a red card. So I look for the red there's, these are all five colors here. I look at red, and this one gets added to my hand, and then it's replaced. So you're not taking a red card from here. You're taking the one that's underneath the red marker. So then let's say next turn I play a green card. I get another recruit and a point, and then I take the card that's under the green spot, which in this case is purple, and so on and so forth. That's how you recruit. When you want to explore, you'll take one of these cards, and you need to discard Vikings equal to the number shown here. So this one says get rid of two blue Vikings. If I do that, I'm going to get possibly some points. Not this one, but this one here gives points. And it's also going to be added to your ship. Adding things to your ship, you can spend bracelets to take everything in the first column. One bracelet, two to take everything in the first two. And spend three bracelets to get all that stuff. So these are going to give you some bonuses and benefits. They're all printed on the top of a car. Like this one gives you a recruit and a ring. And when you are finished with all this stuff, um, you're going to just get your points and it's your turn is over. So you can play the bracelet no matter what action you take. And you can spend recruits to when I'm taking a card. Let's say I played a green card and I don't want this card. I want this card instead. I can spend a recruit to take this card instead. So that's what these tokens are used for. Anyway, when someone gets to 40, that triggers the end of the game. And then whoever has the most points is the winner after that round. There's a lot of things to like about this. Let me mention a couple things I don't like. That little reputation track, at the beginning of every turn, you get points where it's at. First of all, that track is not very well done. It should be shaded so you can see how many points you get very easily. Second, in every game of this I played, almost everyone forgets that every single turn. You just always forget it. Like, oh, that's right. I need to get points at the beginning of my turn. I don't know why. It's a forgettable thing. Secondly, this game is really enjoyable, but for me, it ends a little too early. The idea of putting the lands underneath the middle and using those ring uh, bracelets to get the comms is great, but usually someone hits 40 points before that becomes a thing. It's very rare that I say this about games, that I wish it was just a bit longer, but that's where I am with NAR. Now, that's not a bad thing. I'm still giving it a seven. I find it a very enjoyable game. I like the idea of playing cards, activating them, getting the points, getting stuff every turn you go is fun. 
I mean, you're always going to do something good in your turn, whether it's playing something and getting, even if it's just one card of that color, getting some reward for that. Or once you have a lot of that color, you get tons of rewards for that. Uh, then, or collecting a land and getting points. There's just a lot of cool things going on in it. It is possible for one person to be way ahead of everybody else, and you're like, well, we can't catch them. But it's a nice little filler game to play in between other ones. Gnar. Fly Me to the Moon. So the last game from this company, Streets, I did not enjoy at all from Sinister Fish Games. With their weird box size here that they seem to love so very much. This one's called Moon. I know nothing else about it. Well, I knew nothing else about it. I know now, and let me share it with you. In this game, each person's going to start with a base in front of them, and your goal for this game is to get the most victory points. Well, how do you do this? You're going to do it over the course of three eras, and in each era, you're going to be drafting some structure cards. And when you get these cards, you're going to be building them on both sides of your base, or if you get these pink cards, you'll be able to place them nearby your base, and then you, often you can flip them for special abilities. Now, the reason you want to build blue buildings is because at the beginning of your turn, you're going to get whatever it shows here. So this shows that I'm going to get a green resource, a blue resource, and a gray resource. And I'm going to need these resources because a lot of buildings have that cost on them. You can chuck cards. Every card has a card that cost of a, that you can get rid of. But to get rid of that, you just get that resource. So you can just throw them away on your turn instead of building them. And at the top, they're going to have costs. Now, a lot of buildings have no cost at all. So it's cheap for me to build both of these. You'll notice they have no cost. But if I want to build this trailer park, for example, I would need to pay one blue resource. And as time goes by, the building's costs are going to go up tremendously. You also, for many of the buildings, are going to need flags. So for example, uh, to play this printer card here, I need to have a purple flag. Now, right now, I have two pink flags and a blue flag. But as the game goes by, you're going to have these little rovers. And you can use these rovers. Sometimes you can put a rover on someone else's building, not your own. When you put on someone else's building, you can get the resource that that building would provide, or you can temporarily have the flag that you need to put a building in play. At the end of a round, all these rovers are going to go to that person, which is kind of handy because they'll be able to use these rovers in the future. Now, all this is done in a draft. One player is going to get this card, and everyone else is going to get a random card from the era they're in, these expedition cards. You're going to get one of those, as well as a handful of these structure cards. So when you have these cards in your hand, you are going to pick one, and then you're going to throw it away or play it. But you also can take the ability of this other card in your hand. So this one says, if you assimilate this turn, you get double rewards. If I throw something away, I get double rewards. And I'm passing this around. This also shows who goes first each round. While each of these cards gives you a special ability in your hand, but when you pass your cards to the next player, you pass a special ability. Like this one says, if you park a rover, you score a heart. You score a victory point. So if I use a rover while this card is in my hand, I get a point. But then I'm passing it to the next person. And these cards are going to be the same. Uh, or, um, they're not going to be the same, I'm sorry. They're different from round to round. There's also going to be cards that are placed in the middle of the table that players are trying to score for and try to accomplish various goals. These cards will be out there, and the first person to do them, there's going to be some different gold and bronze trophies, reputation cards, and you'll get victory points for having them. There's some other rules of the game about what happens in between rounds and uh, some, how some victory point cards work, but that's generally how the game goes. After three eras, whoever has the most victory points is the winner. I do want to point out that this game comes with these little boxes that you can store your stuff in. And all of it fits in this long box. I usually complain about that from this company, but this one works really well. Moon is a very enjoyable game. I'm giving this a 7.5 out of 10. There's a lot of games where you build things up. Now, the only reason that I'm not giving it a higher rating is because I think there's a lot to look at. There's a lot of game packed in here. And when there's a spread, you're constantly having to like pinch your eyes and look at the different um, gold cards because you can't ignore them. And I think a little bit of how the, some of the scoring cards work is a little wonky and a little fiddly moving stuff around. But other than that, I do love the fact, the one thing that this game does that's brilliant is the fact that you have that card in your hand that gives you a special ability that gets passed around with drafting. I've never seen that before. 
I like drafting games in general, but to have a special power passed around. Also, you always remember who the first player is because that card passes to that person. And that just works well. And it's also fun. There's no denying you're like, what, you know, by the third area, you're like, and now it's time for me to get resources. <laughs> you know, it's just fun to get that sort of thing. There's also scoring a battle between flags. Who has the most of each flag will score points in between rounds. And so I find it to be an enjoyable game. And I don't mind the packaging as much as I normally do. That's Moon. Finish line to dice game. Now, I normally don't like the covers these days of Queen games, but this one looks really cool. They're bursting through the finish line. Then I looked at the back of the box. This is, it's an accountant, the game. Ooh, these are the sheets. This is a, a, a betting game where you're betting on horses. The designer, Dan Gleiman, I was trying to figure, Glim, I was trying to figure out what he had done before, and but it tells you here on the back of the, on the box is that he's a designer of Dungeon Quest. Oh, Dungeon Quest. I hate Dungeon Quest, but maybe I like this one. You're going to put out for each race seven horses. I don't have them in a line here. I just pretend it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This means it's a favorite horse. This means it is a sturdy horse, a steady runner, sorry. Each player is going to get this big, giant, ugly sheet here for each race. And then the game tells you to study the seven horses about to run. So what that means is randomly just bet stuff on these. You get a thousand bucks, bet it. And you write the odds for each of the horses. The odds, it tells you you're going to write them in here. So the horse that's at the very end has 12 to 1 odds. The horse that's in the front has 2 to 1 odds on them. Okay, so you're going to do that. It's very exciting to just write numbers randomly down and bet. You with no information at all. Yeah, the favorite and steady might mean something, but that's about it. Nothing else matters at all. These numbers are here just to identify them so that you can tell them apart from the Photoshop cut and paste that was done. Anyhow, all the way the race is run is you'll take three dice. Oh, oh, not any three dice. You can't take these yellow dice until the last seven rounds of the game. And you can't take dice that are... if. You have to take two different colors. You will then roll these dice. Now, if you roll all blanks, which is possible because a lot of dice have blanks in them, and in fact, the game decided to equate the name of their game with a blank side. I don't know why. This is a blank. If you roll all blanks, you joyously pass the dice to the next person because you don't get to do anything. Otherwise, you will pick what you want to do. So what do these different sides do? Well, we have the horseshoe. When you have the horseshoe, you put it on a horse. If there already is another horseshoe tile on there, that horse will move forward one. Or if they're favorite, ooh, favorite, they move up one. And then we take the die off. Yes, I don't know why there's four dice on a card either. Now, this green die is all about money. If you get this, you put it on a horse. And if that horse wins... Anyone who has put bets on that will get half the amount of dice for bonus for placing and the full amount if it wins. But if you get this side of the die, some of these dice, this one is blank. Okay, other than that, you're going to put money on the, on the horse. These red dice, you'll love these parts. There's double horseshoes. That will move a horse up immediately. So that's fantastic. But there's also whipping. Whipping doesn't do anything, but if you put two whipping on a horse... You can't put on steady horses, but you can put on any other horse. That horse is immediately out of the race and are no longer running. There's also this cool tempo change, which lets you move a horseshoe from one die to another horse. That's crazy. All right, let's talk about the yellow dice here. So this one here just makes a horse go back two positions, period. You can't pick the horse that's in last or second to last. This one here lets you pick any three tiles and rearrange them. I'm like, ah! I'm going to do this. So that's kind of strategic. This one here lets you move any horse you want to have two positions, but only if they're favorite or if it has a white horseshoe die on it. And then this one is dead even. Whoever's second goes next to the leader. So now they're dead even. There's two horses in first place. Well, that's very, very exciting. Now, these yellow dice, remember, can only be picked at the very end. But there's these black dice. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention about them. If you roll the X on a black die, you just put a horse, and that horse is out. You can't put on a steady runner, so that's fine. That one is out of the race. If you get inside tip, you take two dice and put them back in. Yay! If you uh, do this one, you put it in front of you, and after the race is over, you get to put this on one horse, and that horse will hit a free horseshoe, which may or may not move it. But this, which will become your favorite die, 
You, the whoever goes after you, will skip their turn. And they pay you $500. They lose $500 and you gain $500. So when the race is over and whatever horses are left, so probably just four, because you're going to have horses that are gone. Then you're going to get money based on whether things won or lost. So you'll say the amount that you've won. Then you get $2,000 added to your money and you can bet again on the second race and third race with seven new horses. At the end of three excruciatingly long races, whoever has the most wins. So again, remember, on your turn you have three dice, you roll them, then the die that you used is gone, and another die is added and the next person goes. That's the game. Folks, this game is trash. I hate this game. This game is terrible. You know, I'm trying to struggle to think of anything good about this game, so I'll say this. this the cover is good. Other than that, this is the worst game I've played this year. I'm giving this a 1 out of 10. Wow. How can I count the ways this game is bad? Are you shooting the horses? You play dice, and then the horses just go out of the race. At the beginning, it tells you. Like I said, you're sort of like, study the horses. And blah, 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 study the horses. What kind of studying am I doing? I'm looking at them. Some horses have an S on them. That's the only thing. It's so stupid. And then there's dice, and you, and you draft dice, and you roll the dice. Rolling three blanks. Well, that's fun. That's a bad mechanism. That's objectively terrible. And then the one where you just steal 500 points from someone else. What? So between you killing horses, because that's the only thing I can think that's happening, because when you race seven horses, four of them aren't disqualified in a single race. And that's going to happen in most of your races because you're going to roll stuff. You're like, well, I guess I could put a horseshoe on a horse or whip this horse. And, or you're caught whipping, I guess. And then if you're caught whipping twice, you're ejected. It's just nonsense. Bad component quality. It's boring. Everyone's going to hate it. You are randomly writing numbers down and randomly hoping your stuff will win. You don't really get to control the horse as much. I mean, think about it. You're drafting a die and you put a white horseshoe in a die. That means if you put another one on them, they will move up one space. What is this? There are so many games that do the same thing better. There are so many horse racing games out there. I think I can tell you this. If you're ever wondering, should I buy Finish Line or any other horse game in existence on the planet Earth, and that includes one my five-year-old daughter made this morning. I don't have a five-year-old daughter. It's a bad analogy. Still, get that game over this one. Terrible, terrible. I really dislike this, and everyone I play with hated it. But, but, let's not end on that negative note. There are many positive good games out there. Check them out. Thanks so much for watching, folks. You can find all these reviews by themselves, short, short reviews, on Dice Tower Encore, our sister channel. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching the Dice Tower.